Well, and a good Saturday morning to you viewers. Thanks so much for tuning in this Saturday for my weekly research review. This week, we've got five articles that we're going to talk about. But before we do, we're going to do our dad jokes for the week. These dad jokes come to us courtesy of the website JustBallGloves.com. Uh, obviously, these are gloves related to athletic activity. But So here's your dad jokes. Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? Decent food, but no atmosphere. <laughs> okay. What did the buffalo say as his son left? Bye, son. <laughs> these, these are really bad. I, I grant you that. So, Okay, enough really bad dad jokes. Let's move on to our first article. And this morning, that is going to be a study that was done out of, uh, all that was done by Chinese. It was using databases from elsewhere in the world, including the UK database. It's a very large study. And it is on the relationship of seven different psychiatric traits or disorders. <laughs> and the risk for increased carotid media thickness, intima media. So what they're looking at is the thickness of the carotid artery, which is a reflection of the extent to which there might be arterial disease or even atherosclerotic plaque buildup in the carotid arteries. You all know that this is often seen as a precursor to stroke or to at least reduce blood flow into the brain among other problems. So this study used very large samples. Uh, they had over 226,000 individuals with ADHD, they had over 363,000 with bipolar disorder, major depression, about 142,000. They also looked at autism spectrum disorder, anxiety disorder, and so on. And they compared these individuals for the thickness of their carotid arteries. And what did they find? They found that only those with ADHD had increased carotid artery thickness, arguing for the fact that ADHD may be associated with increased risk for arterial disease in these carotid arteries and, of course, other related problems. So this is not really new. There have been a few papers suggesting that ADHD predisposes to a variety of cardiovascular problems. Even in my own Milwaukee follow-up study where we followed children for more than 20 years and then did physical exams on them when they reached age 27 to 32, roughly, what we found is that they had an increased likelihood of arterial disease given all of the risk factors we saw in their lives. Risk of smoking, excess alcohol use, poor diet, such as a focus on a more junk food, Western fast food type diet high in carbohydrates. And then of course, increased abuse of other substances. And on top of that, increased risk of obesity. So given all of those factors, one would expect to see increased arterial disease. And of course, this study shows that is in fact the case. So uh, a very nice large scale study published over in the journal Frontiers in Cardiovascular Medicine. Next up is going to be a small study that looks at whether or not listening to music benefits children with ADHD in their work performance. In this case, they were taking a psychological test known as the Attention Network Test. And they compared 76 children, broken down into 34 with ADHD and 42 typically developing children. And they put both groups of children through two tasks or two conditions. First, they had to perform the test without music, and then they performed it with music. Uh, and so you've got children taking these tests with and without ADHD and with and without music in the background. And what did they find? They found that music benefited both groups of children, not necessarily benefiting the ADHD children any more than the typical children, but both made fewer errors on the attention network test 
while they were performing the, the test than did those not listening to music. So music does appear to help somewhat with concentration and with attention. By the way, this effect was found nearly 40 years ago by Howard Abakoff and his colleagues out of New York City in a study that they did of ADHD children doing homework and found that listening to music while they did homework did benefit them in their productivity and work performance. So yet another study showing that some background stimulation, in this case music, might be helpful to children with ADHD when they're doing their work. My next study is published over in the Journal of Research in Psychopathology, and it's a review by a group of professionals from Iran in which they look at whether or not the QEEG, particularly the theta-beta ratio, is helpful in diagnosing ADHD. Now understand we have had decades of research showing that people with ADHD show lower EEG arousal, that is less beta wave activity. Beta is the wavelength of the brain electrical activity that's associated with concentration. Theta is associated with not concentrating, with uh, being inattentive, under aroused, and possibly <clears throat> even some sleepiness. But so we've known this for years. This is not new. They have reduced beta and they have increased theta as if the brain is under aroused or under arousable in response to stimulation. So they review all of that research, nothing new there. But what they're specifically looking at was the recommendation by some people in the research literature and also by neurofeedback clinicians that the ratio of the theta bandwidth to the beta bandwidth on the EEG might be a marker for ADHD, might be a useful diagnostic index. These authors reviewed all of the research and concluded that while there was evidence of greater theta and less beta activity in ADHD, that the ratio did not seem to be particularly diagnostic of ADHD, nor indicative of which presentation of ADHD the individual had. So not necessarily supportive there of using EEG for diagnostic purposes. All right. My fourth study is in the International Journal of Psychology, and this is a study examining whether or not symptoms of autism spectrum disorder and symptoms of ADHD, among other symptoms such as negative mood, is related to excessive internet use. This study, as you can see, comes out of Australia, and it is a comparison uh, or excuse me, an evaluation of 248 individuals. These are relatively typical people. They are sampled from the general population and they filled out rating scales of symptoms. So mind you, this is not a clinical population. So they filled out rating scales of autism spectrum and of ADHD among other traits. And then they looked at the relationship of the measures to excessive internet use. And what they found was that the path analysis they did indicated that the relationship between autism spectrum and internet, excessive internet use or internet addiction was entirely mediated by the degree of ADHD symptoms and to a lesser extent, negative moods. Now this has been shown previously, a lot of other studies that I've talked about on this uh, broadcast on my channel here have shown a relationship between ADHD and uh, internet addiction, excessive internet gaming, and so on. This study finds the same thing and shows that where it exists in individuals with autism spectrum symptoms, it's likely their ADHD symptoms that are contributing to their excessive internet use. But I remind you, it's a study of the general population, not of clinical levels of autism spectrum or ADHD, but still an interesting study that kind of replicates other studies showing that there's something more specific about ADHD and to a lesser extent negative mood that increases the likelihood of excessive internet use. 
Our final study of this week is a, a, a study of children looking at whether or not hyperactivity or movement in those with ADHD benefits them during task performance. So this study is going to take 24 children with ADHD uh, 24 children without ADHD and have them perform certain psychological tests, specifically the Stroop test, among others. And then some of the individuals are asked to remain stationary while they're doing their work, and others are given the opportunity to engage in cycling while sitting at a desk and taking these tests. And what did they find? Well, what's interesting is not only did they find that movement benefited the ADHD children during task performance, it did not produce any incremental benefits for the typical children. So it seems to be the ADHD children who benefit from moving during task performance. Now, also interesting in this study, and I hadn't seen this done before, is that they were using functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which is a measure of cerebral blood flow in the brain. And what they found is that during movement in the ADHD children, it increased blood flow to the left prefrontal area. We know this area is associated with executive functioning generally and with concentration specifically, as well as with inhibition to a certain extent. So what's interesting is they appear to have shown the mechanism by which increasing movement increases blood flow to this part of the brain. And that may be why movement improves task performance, but only in ADHD children, not in typical children. So very interesting study there. And you can see the name of the article is Hyperactivity in ADHD friend or foe? And the answer they provide is it's helpful. It's your friend. So, okay, that's our last article. I hope you found this research review this week to be informative and think about subscribing if you haven't already or recommending this channel to others that might be interested in science-based information about ADHD. All right then, this is Russ Barkley signing off this Saturday. Hope you have a good weekend. And as always, live well and be well, and please take care.